Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Brian Broom, and today we're talking about Ehud and Eglon, every junior high boy's favorite part of the Book of Judges. It needs no more introduction than that, in my Except opinion. Except for the people who've never, ever read the story. Well, that's why we're going to read it, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll read. Here we go. This is the book of Judges, chapter 3. Uh, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, these would be mercenaries, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. That's the ruins or the rebuilding of Jericho. So, and that's a key point, is that the, the valley or the narrow defile that runs down from Jerusalem toward Jericho is the one key uh, egress and access from the Promised Land across Jordan. So, he's, they're, they're holding key territory, key transport lines. Um, and went and smote Israel, possessed the city of palm trees, and the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, that is, they repented, the Lord raised them up a deliver, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite. A man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present to Eglon, king of Moab. The Benjamites, um, left-handedness seems to have run in the tribe. We will run into this more times in the former the former prophets in um, Judges. We'll run into a bunch of left-handed Benjamites, and later on, I believe in the time of David, we come across them again. So it was a is genetic handedness, thing. Is it usually genetic today? Yeah, yeah, I hardly didn't know. know that. But it's a rare, but it's a rare thing. Yeah. I mean, if you want to find out in a role-playing game whether you're left-handed or right-handed or ambidextrous, you roll a 20-sided <laughs> die and a six-sided die. The 20-sided die is higher, you're right-handed. Six-sided die is higher, you're left-handed. And if the numbers come out the same, you're ambidextrous. And those actually do fit percentages pretty well. Wow, so, that's yeah. more complicated than one in four, which is what I thought. Yeah, no, it's not, <laughs> not like that. Anyhow, there's there's actually a, 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 a um, meta pun here. Because when Benjamin was born to Rachel, oh, ja that's Jacob right. called him Ben Ami, so the son of my right hand. The son of my right hand, except he's left handed. Uh, <laughs> okay. <Ironic. laughs> but in that world, uh, left handedness was looked upon as unusual to the point of being a deformity. And so most nations, tribes, cities, peoples didn't let their children be left handed, they beat it out of them. And so if you're left-handed and you're allowed to get away with it, you're obviously you're, you know, not very bright, not nothing to worry about. But in Israel, they understood that this is simply one of God's gifts. So he's he's left-handed, it's going to be important. Well, they send a present. The, the, the word is tribute. They're sending tribute because Moab is their overlords right now. But this man Ehud, this leader of the tribe, uh, makes himself a dagger. Verse 16, but Ehad made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length. So about, what, 18 inches long, give or take? And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. Now, right-handed people draw from the left, but left-handed people draw from the right. Guards who are not uh, serious about their work will patch you down on your right side, your, the side you would draw from, well, like nor the other, because no one draws over. That's cross drawing. That's now yeah, nobody does that. So if, as long as the guards, <laughs> government aren't, workers, always yeah. known for taking the path of least resistance. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. And he brought the present into Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. Body shaming going on here. No, but it plays <laughs> into the story. It's important detail. God doesn't throw that in just to, just to mock him. Although mockage is happening. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. Eglon was a very fat man. And when he made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, the bearers. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. Quarries is not very clear. The march note says graven images. It may be that there were idols that they had set up publicly to sort of mark their dominance. Whatever it was, it was something that served as a boundary line or maybe a mental trigger. And so Ehad lets his guys go beyond that. He turns around now and goes back to talk to the king a second time. He goes back and says, I have a secret errand unto thee. 
So again, he has some place, some position as an Israelite leader. And of course, that's important to our whole discussion here. Uh, because the king doesn't say, who are you? Go away. He says, keep silence. You have a, you have a, a, a secret errand, a secret mission. Maybe you know something. Maybe you know about some kind of conspiracy against me. I don't trust all my guys. Hmm, maybe this is important. And if he won't tell in front of uh, my advisors, maybe one of them says, all right, everybody get out of here. I need to talk to this guy alone. Notice how absolutely confident Eglon is because he's not afraid of Ehud. He's got hired security. What does he need to worry about? Yeah, well, but he's kicking them all out, see? They, they but, all... but he's been patted down. He's been oh, he's yes, made he's it been, past the security check. Right. He's been through the metal detector and all that, and, and nothing showed up. Uh, he said, uh, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And he had came unto him. So they move up into a summer parlor, the King James said. It's um, a patio on the roof that's walled in with lattices, not glass for windows. And so he, the king is there and he had is there. And he had says, I have a message from God unto thee. And the king rises up out of his seat because when God speaks, it is appropriate for those who hear to stand up and show respect by listening, which once upon a time was common in Christian liturgies, but not so much anymore. Uh, so the king's rising, which makes this a whole lot easier to do because if he's sitting on his throne, the target's a little, little sketchier. And he had put forth his left hand. So again, the king does not instantly sense, sense a threat here because what's, what's he got over there? Parchment? Some piece of information, some something, some clue. So he's watching, and um, he takes it to the uh, dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly, and the haft also went in after the blade. He he is so fat that the fat actually acts like suction and pulls this eighteen inch blade all the way in, including the haft. And he ends there trying to pull it out, and he can't. <laughs> so there's some dark comedy going on here. The haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. He's cut into his colon, and the process excrement starts pouring out, out the hole the dagger has created and is going everywhere. Then Ehud went straight through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor and locked them. So while Eglon is gurgling out his last breaths and falling down into his own excrement, um, our friend Ehud is locking the doors from the inside, going out through one of the lattice doors or windows, and escaping to call an army together. And when he was gone, his servants, Eglon's servants, came, and when they saw that, behold, the door of the parlor, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, surely he covereth his feet in the summer chamber. There's a nice euphemism, cover your feet. Mm -hmm. If you are wearing robes and you need to drop them, sort of like today when a gentleman needs to use the facilities, he needs to kind of drop his pants, the pants cover the feet. That's what's going on here. They, they, they can smell the odor. And they're waving their hands in front of their nose saying, okay, he's using the bathroom. Oh, boy, it's terrible. Yeah, well, nothing new there, is there? I guess not. So they're not shocked or surprised by the smell. This guy is gross in his eating habits and gross in his elimination. Um, and so they, they, they're just waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting. And they tarried till they were ashamed. Eventually, they get embarrassed. Wait, what is he doing in there? Still smells horrible. In fact, it smells worse. Something else, some other smell is kicking in there. We can't just stand here forever. It's already been like two or three hours. Okay, someone get a key? They get a key. Behold, he opened not the door of the parlor. Therefore, they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. He had escaped while they tarried, passed beyond the quarries, escaped to Syriath. It came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the Mount of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the Mount, and he before them, so he's leading them. And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab, 
and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for score years. And that's the story. And uh, I think you're right. Most junior high boys revel in this story. <laughs> I suspect there are a lot of females, however, particularly in some certain types of males, who don't know that's in the Bible, which is sad because it's not nice. I mean, if you're going to explain it, you have to explain where, what they thought their king was doing, why they, why they thought that, what had actually happened to him, why they're waiting. All of those things go into this. And if you try to leave them out, you still have an issue that a lot of people have trouble with. Well, Who's this Barra guy anyway? And why does he get away with assassination and murder? <laughs> well, this is another time when God uses bad people to accomplish his purposes. We'll just, well, we'll skip this story. Kids don't need to know the story. But this is, this is the progression of the book of Judges. And this is the second judge that we've run into. The first was Othniel, uh, who was a type and figure of Christ undoubtedly. And so as we come to this judge, we should expect to find, again, a type and figure of Christ. Here, his, he, he has two weapons. Three, he has his apparent disability, his, the disrespect people showed him, that he's despised and rejected, mm. you know, scarred, mutilated. I mean, he uses his left hand. How, how socially awkward is that? And he's got that, and he's got his dagger, and he has creative imagination. So, He's good at lying. So I'm thinking of the Greek phalanx where all of the soldiers lock together their shields in close close quarters and form this impenetrable barrier with their shields. That doesn't work with a left no. a lefty. No, it wouldn't. So this is a real military disadvantage. I mean, I don't know that the Moabites were using phalanxes. But, <laughs> but just thinking through it in the yeah. ancient world, how much of a disadvantage this would be considered. Yeah, it, you're, it, it would be. the great city cannot maintain its unity with aberrations like left-handed people. <laughs> yeah, so we simply we will not tolerate them. And I, I see in our school community we're, we're drawing more and more from ethnic groups that have not been in the country so long. Grandparents may be first first people to come to America. It's not as the parents who are first generation, and sometimes the kids weren't born in America. And within these communities, and I, th I think you can find the same thing in basically any kind of community where it's just this one comes to mind quickly, there are certain things that are not done. You never go for counseling. You never see a psychiatrist. You That's common enough in America. You yeah. Know, you, you know, you, long, there, there's a long time list families of, here. Yeah. There, there's all list of things that are considered shameful or unbiblical or out of our culture that you just don't do. And it's not that there's a written rule as such. It's just, if we did this, it would be a great shame to the family. Therefore, either one, we're not doing it, or if we do it, we're not telling anybody. And that's kind of what left-handedness was. If at all possible, you broke your kid of it right away. And if somehow it crept, crept out, you covered it up as best you could, and you lied about it, didn't draw attention to it because it was shameful. But Israel was different. Israel was open to possibilities, possibility that God does not make everyone exactly the same. And so this bit of culture makes a big difference in terms of what Ehud is able to do here. He's able to pull off this bluff, this espionage, I don't know what the right word would be, sneaking into the enemy's camp and assassinating their leader because Israel doesn't share a cultural taboo that they have. Don't have left-handed kids. Isn't that not playing fair? Yeah, that's not playing fair one bit. This would be called war. <laughs> but it's it's amazing how much trouble Christians who have not fought in a war have with this sometimes. I, I don't think anyone who's actually been a soldier in active duty has any trouble with uh, infiltrating enemy lines, spying, camouflage, deliberately deceiving the enemy as to where you are or where you're going. That's part of warfare. But I think sometimes people who don't know war at all just think, well, you go out on the battlefield and you kind of shoot at each other. Okay, this is not <laughs> this is not 1776. 
Uh, even Thankfully. Washington didn't. Hmm? Thankfully, it's not. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're actually allowed to hide behind things. Uh, America I, so kind I of actually, started that tradition. I started reading Michael Shara's uh, The Killer Angels recently. Mm-hmm. And the the opening has one of the generals kind of displeased with the fact that he has to, has to listen to a spy for information. Mm. I'm kind of wondering if Michael Shara had any historical basis for that portrayal or if that was his own bias <laughs> in reading the character. Mm-hmm. It, it's not unlikely. I mean, in in the later Middle Ages on into the Reformation era, Battles were fought in open fields between enemy combatants. You were not to go and bother civilians. They were to stay off the field. You were not to go bother them. And you fought it out there, out in the open. Those were the established rules of warfare for Christian civilized nations. (laughs) For Christian civilizations. That's (laughs) an important phrase there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, you're fighting Christians, you assume that. You're fighting someone else, you probably don't assume that. But among Christian nations, we you know we, we don't need to kill the common people. We'll just kill each, kill each other, like gentlemen. Kill the people who have signed up to be killed. Yeah, pretty much. And it's, as farcical as that may sound, it did work to a certain extent until, well, with the War of the Roses, we, not the War of the Roses, the Hundred Years' War in France, we begin to get to see that violated. By the time of the American Civil War, it's kind of gone out the window. World War One destroyed what was left of it. Mm-hmm. When uh, the the common citizens became targets and the idea of, well, if we kill enough of them, maybe they'll decide to change their plans. And in, uh, in Israel with the Canaanites, yeah, no quarter. They, they, this, this was a fight to the death. And so you got who you could. And Ehud realizes that he can, if he can win a decisive victory, he can get a following. But as in other cases that we're going to run into the book of Judges, without the leader making the first decisive strike, no one wants to follow. Think of David and Goliath. If you don't take out the big man, nobody else is willing to invest or risk their lives. So this is what he's doing. He's not simply, this is not simply personal anger. Boy, I hate these guys. Boy, I'd I'd just give a chance to kill this king. He understands what he has to do. He is... The, the leader, the judge, war leader and civil judge, and the one that God has put in authority, the one that the people recognize as authority. If he can't fight a battle, why is anyone else going to want to? This brings us to another question. Does this mean then that in warfare, it's all right to go targeting national leaders? As I recall, we did that not long ago. <laughs> but there was a long history of us not doing that. And the only reason I ever heard for that was, well, if we go after their leaders, if we send assassins, they'll send assassins after ours. And your point would be, well, we, we don't want to get killed. I mean, we're the brains here. They can kill every, other people. But let's if we have a nice gentleman's agreement between the leaders and none of us are going out, at least till the very <laughs> end, then we can have a nice peaceful war and I can go to sleep every night safe not knowing that nin- ninja assassins are coming through my window. <laughs> That's like <laughs> Lord Farquaad in Trek. <laughs> Some of you may die, but that is a sacrifice I am willing to make. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so here's this guy. He's, aside from being brave, um, aside from his faith in God, we're not told that he's a great warrior. Uh, we, we're not told that he does anything else on a military basis. He does. He he gives orders. He summons the troops. He apparently, he's the one who has the strategy of taking the fords and giving the orders. But we're not told he's like David's mighty men who take out hundreds or thousands of Philistines single-handedly. He is in a position of responsibility, and he understands that to turn the tide, he has to strike first. And yeah, by by taking out their leader, he opens himself up to all kinds of things. But tsh, they're already enslaved. They already know who he is. What's, what's he got to lose? He has a world to gain for the kingdom of God. And so somewhere in here, the word vigilante has to come up, if only to dismiss it almost immediately. Mm-hmm. He was a judge. Uh, this is the book of Judges. We're walking through Judges. 
Uh, he's part of the pattern. I don't remember if he actually, I don't think he's ever actually called a judge in context here. But he performs the, the role of the judge. God raised them up a deliverer. Oh, even better, he's a deliverer. Mm. He's a savior. Mm. He's a type of Christ. Othniel sets a pattern in that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He's a, a Messiah type. And most of the other judges, it's either is said or implied or hinted at, or we deduce from the flow of the story. Yeah, this is where the judge comes up. We're, we're told in, the, in the, uh, the introductory thing, God raised up the judge and God was with the judge. So God raised him up. So he is a judge. He is a deliverer. This is a legitimate authority. We're not told exactly how he got the position. We're not told that a prophet appeared or the angel of the Lord or some burning bush or a star from heaven or whatever. Most likely, he was elected by the tribe of Benjamin for what to them seemed good and sufficient reasons. Maybe his dad had been some kind of high muckety buck. Maybe he had done something noble at some time in his past and everyone loved him. Maybe he was just showed great wisdom for his age. We're not told, and it doesn't matter. But somehow the people recognized him as a judge, and not just the tribe of Benjamin, because although Benjamin is right there where the, the pathway leads up from Jordan up past Jerusalem, the, the tribe of Benjamin's borders began at Jerusalem. So he's right, that, that tribe is right there. But it, it's there's more than that involved. The the Moabites are kind of starting there and going. And so the other tribes too that are involved in this, which is not necessarily everybody, but it's probably some others, they follow his leadership. They want in on this once he's, he's won the decisive battle. Once he struck at the head of the enemy and brought him down, then the people are willing to fight the battle and drive the enemy out and reclaim the promised land. So is he a vigilante? No. And I, I don't know. I don't think we've had this discussion. I don't know if this is the place for it. But the idea of vigilantism appeals deeply to the American psyche. Mm -hmm. um, today, of course, in the Marvel Universe, the DC Universe, on film, it's all over the place. How many of these people actually are licensed by the government? All oh, right, Marvel turned Captain into America. Yeah, until he said no to the what are the agreements called? The, uh, the Sokovia Accords. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, which he was totally right to do, in my unbiased opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I mean, I'm with you because the the anytime somebody says, "Hey, the United Nations said that you should just immediately stop them," yeah, you should just stop. Yeah, yeah. 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 As if the United Nations has any authority. Well, we say they do. Right. Well, we shouldn't be saying they do, and it's contrary to our constitution. Anyhow. <laughs> um DC definitely has Batman though. Which yeah. like I mean, my problem with Batman isn't so much that he's a vigilante. It's it's kind of like, okay, I can suspend my disbelief for for the moment for, with regard to that. But he never takes care of the problem. It's like if you would just kill the Joker. This will be over. But he's like, no, I don't want to kill people. Anyway. He doesn't kill people. Yeah. One of my Why favorite. not? There's not like a qualitative difference between lethal force and non-lethal force. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, comic kind things was, you know, this quote from Batman. I don't know if, I don't remember which, if it was from a game or comic or whatever. He goes like, if you kill a killer. The number of killers in the world remains the same, and then Whoa. like in the comics, <laughs> one of his one of one of the Robins goes off and becomes like a I'm gonna murder everyone so that they stop being bad guys, and so like <laughs> that guy pops up in the background. And he goes like, but if you kill two murderers, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the math gets a lot more favorable. No, mm -hmm. no. Anyway, um, back to vigilante. <laughs> Well, it, it goes much deeper than that. It goes back to our Wild West at the very least. Mm -hmm. And all the dime novels that celebrated uh, the cowpokes and the marshals and the self-appointed lone rangers who go out there and shoot people dead to bring justice to the, to the West. Now, TV watered that down a little bit to the point of saying, well, all they do is shoot the guns out of their hands. <laughs> Because that's so yeah, easy to do definitely. in the middle of a firefight. You know, it's not easy to do. Can't, it, sometimes it can be done, but that's no, no. If you, FBI agents and, and such get this all the time. Well, why do you have to kill them? Why don't you just shoot the guns out of their hands? You try it. <laughs> yeah, you try. We're, we're trained to aim for center of mass. Thank you very much, because that's the fastest way to end this. 
They don't want to be shot. They should not be shooting people. Um, mm-hmm. But we're and uh, and to whatever it takes to end this means stop the threat. It doesn't mean kill them. Although that might well happen in the process. The yeah, main it, thing is to stop the threat. And if their life, they're using their life force to be a threat. Well, they need to be stopped. They need to be stopped. And I suppose that we should also, on the one hand, there's the vigilantism of of the American West that says anybody with a gun or with a good pair of fists can go out and bonk the bad guys or shoot the bad guys and bring them down and be the hero and get the girl and ride off into the sunset. And that's good. And we all applaud. Law and order. Well, yeah, he, they're, they're fighting for law and order, sort of. <laughs> Not any kind of legislative judicial law, but, you know, the, the law of one's own heart and what all good men know they ought to do. Uh, I grew up, as I've said many times, uh, amidst lots and lots of old Westerns on TV. And pretty much all of them at some point or another, the hero, if it was if it was designed for kids, yes, he shoots the gun out of the guy's hand. Think Lone Ranger, think Cisco Kid. The actor who played the Cisco Kid made a point never to shoot anybody. Lone Ranger, shoot the guns out of their hands. That's fine. Those are for kids. For adults, the prime time shows, they normally ended up killing somebody. Of course, they had to. It was the only way to save somebody. But it was a regular thing. <laughs> I, I, That's I why we say, have the Disney villain death of somebody falling off a cliff to their yeah. death instead of being shot by the good guy. Because we don't yeah. want the good guy to shoot people. We don't want the good guy to kill good guy to kill anybody, and the, and there's that romanticism that thinks that if we just talk it over with the bad guy, if we just show him love, if indeed we lay down our weapons so that he understands we're not a threat, then he'll lay down his, and we can all <laughs> sit around the fire, sing "Came by I," and have a root beer together or something. And there is no reckoning with human sin and depravity. We we, we don't we don't understand that some people are so wicked. They enjoy killing people. They feel no remorse, and they will go on doing it until someone stops them. And whereas we are not licensed to go about individually, privately doing that, God did give the state a sword, which is an instrument of violence, to protect the innocent. Mm. And this is basic biblical doctrine, and yet there are Christians who are very uncomfortable with it and don't want to talk about that. And just, you know, but, but love because we're buying too much into the world's romanticism. And then on the other hand, those who say, yeah, give me a gun, I'll go hunt them all down. No, we don't want you either. <laughs> this, this, is, this is orderly. God has appointed a way of doing this as far as, well, I'm just defending myself. Okay, what, he's in your house? Well, you know, he's on the porch or in the street or the next street over or... He's the in the neighborhood someplace. Yeah, I, I, I'm i just going to go, you know, go for a drive. And if I encounter it, no, 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 no. The Bible is pretty specific. There, there are two case laws, I think, that reflect on the issue of vigilantism or self-defense or raising a weapon in defense of someone. The obvious one is in Exodus, what is it, 22, where if you're in home at night and there's an intruder in your house, you have a right of self-defense up to and including killing him. No questions asked because no one should be in your house in the middle of the night when it's dark. Now, if, if he, the idea, the implication is you don't know who this is. If he stumbles through the door and says, honey, I'm home, you, that's probably a clue that he's just got the wrong house and <laughs> that he may be drunk, but he's not a threat. Uh, the assumption is you do not know who this is. It is dark. They did not, they could not just flip a switch and have a light on or pull out a flashlight and shine it in his face. So you do not know who it is. You do not know if he's armed or not. He is in your house at night where he has absolutely no business. Generally, these were one-room houses where husbands and wives and children and animals all slept together. So he is not just threatening you in your bedroom or office or living room. He's, he's right there in the bedroom with all of you together, and you don't know who it is, and he may have a weapon. Under such circumstances, you are allowed to use deadly force, and it's on him. However, the Bible says, if the sun be written, risen upon him, that is, light's coming through, you see his face just fine, and you see what he's holding is a broken beer bottle. Okay, at this point, you have lots of options, yelling, screaming, tackling him, trying to get everyone out the door, and only as a last line of defense do you have any business trying to kill him, because you know who he is, you can get the posse together, get the judges, and 
find him and, and do all that. And our generation, dial 911, could give his description to the police. And, and if he's just out on your porch or out in your barn, no. In biblical law, that doesn't work. And in California law, it doesn't work. I once asked the question of a, well, a friend of mine, a former student who was, uh, at the time, I believe, is a deputy DA. You know, he's a superior court judge. And I said, this this is what the Bible says. How does California law? Said, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hmm. Because unless he's right in your house, don't even think about it. Call the police or just get out of there. Because the Bible does respect life. You don't just say, well, he's trespassing. I get to kill him, right? No, you don't, as a matter of fact. Um, the other case law that bears on this, and very, very indirectly, but I think it's a valid call, the case where a raped or a woman, a married woman, is being raped in the city. Hmm. And it says... If it's in the city and she's found that she's been sexually violated, the assumption is, and again, this is, this is the quick overview and there are a million what ifs that hang on it. But to make the point is, if she's in the city and, she, and, and we didn't hear her, then the assumption is she consented because no woman wants to be raped. Now, why would she call out? Because that's only going to make the guy more evil or more mad and he presumably has a weapon or she'd be kicking him in places anyhow. So you hear a woman scream rape in ancient Israel. What is your job? What is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to run toward the scream as fast as you can and confront a man who presumably will be armed. Is that really safe? Well, if you also, if we all got swords, <laughs> then yeah, it probably is because you're a member of the militia. You've been trained in how to use the sword. You have your sword with you. You can take this guy out. You can rescue the woman. In other words, the woman, insofar as it is possible for her, is required to call for help. And you can think, well, what if she had? What if? Yes, understood. Those are all valid what ifs. But the assumption here is if she could have called and didn't, then she's blameworthy. If she's, on the other hand, if she's out in the countryside, we simply assume she was raped and the guy is executed and she, the, he doesn't get to question her or anything. It's just over for him. But the, the possibility of help, that, that, that help is such a, help is a real possibility. That is people who are armed are expected to come running if you cry rape. In the of city. course, it would be really nice if the woman were armed with, say, a great equalizing weapon that would negate any difference in size and strength between her <laughs> and her attacker, for instance, That'd be really nice. you know, just hypothetically. AK-47? Yeah, one uh, of those. <laughs> There is a story, I don't know if I've used it yet, we will use it again when we get to Dapper, but I'm going to go ahead and put it out there anyway. There was a young woman in Texas, of course it was Texas, her husband had recently died of cancer, he'd been military, I believe, and had left a couple of guns around the house, she had a, a new baby. And some guys came to the door and kind of were harassing her, talking at her. They were probably drunk. But she shoes them off, but she kind of listens at the door, locks the door. And, but it sounds like they're not going away. They're still there. Voices are rising. And she's getting worried. And then the, she begins to hear pounding on the door. Let us in. Let us in. She goes to the first. She, she takes the baby, puts the baby in another room where it will be safe. And um, she gets her shotgun and calls the sheriff and says, there are a couple of thugs at my door. They're, they're, they've been pounding at the door. Now they're, okay, they're trying to force the door now. I am alone. I have a baby. If they cross the threshold, can I shoot them dead? And the, the police responders, um, well, uh, I can't really tell you. They're, the door is about to give way. Can I shoot them? Well, uh, we, we can have a guy there real soon. Uh, I mean, in fact, we've dispatched somebody. It's too late. He's the, the door's about to give now. Can I shoot them? I can't tell you you can shoot them, but I can tell you you have to protect that baby. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. When the DA chose not to press charges. Um, <laughs> good. Yes. We'll come back to the story when we talk yeah, about I, uh, I feel jail. like that case might have gone down differently in California. Yeah. It really might yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, the, the thought that certainly men who serve in the militia will likely be armed doesn't mean that women can't be armed, too. But the whole supposition is she is about to be raped. because So if she had a weapon, she probably would not be about to be raped. Mm -hmm. So this is the woman who's not armed. Maybe in the future she'll be armed. So this is what the Bible gives us in terms 
of self-defense. Is it right to have a, a lethal weapon on you? Yes, the right to keep and bear arms is as old as uh, at least the English Bill of Rights, 1688-ish, 1689, whatever, right after George, uh, William and Mary came to the throne. And interestingly there, it's phrased as a religious principle. Christian men have the right to keep and bear arms, the idea being to defend themselves against their persecutors. Mm -hmm. And then it was carried over into the Second Amendment here without reference to its original. Yeah, Protestants are likely to be killed by, mm, so, mm. and there, there's biblical justification for this. And there's biblical justification for defending your own household and those who are present with you. There is no justification for go hunting down people on the street, let alone in some other city, because you feel a calling to level things out. A decade or so ago, there were there were guys who felt they were justified in going and shooting abortionists because they're murderers and the state's not doing its job. So I have a right, I have a, not only a right, I have an obligation under God to protect life. No, you don't. That's not your call. That's not your backyard. Forget your backyard. That's not your bedroom. And no one here is calling for help. Well, the baby can't. This is so. And the civil authorities will answer to God for this. Mm. But you I mean, the, are, the baby has right. someone appointed to protect her. Yeah. That would be the mother. That would be the mother. And the father, too. And actually. the father, yes. And they More so the father. <laughs> yeah, they're going to answer for this. But we are not summoned to save every life that could, in th we might, in theory, possibly be able to save. Because life is not the greatest thing in God's world. Obedience to God's law, faith in Christ, fear of God. Those are the great things. Mm. And, um, and really, the whole, the whole issue with vigilantism is what your respective sphere of authority is, yeah. your level of yeah. authority, yeah. as a non- or I'm going to use the word ordained, and I, I is, is that what? Well, I think I think ordained works yeah, here because for uh, for civil servants as well. Yeah. Is that what they? Well, yeah, they well, don't anyway. call that, but but the Bible assumes that they're ministers of God, deacons of God. So I think ordination is fine as long as we understand. Okay, it's cool. to a different office. Cool. Okay, so yeah, uh, you know, if you are a standard citizen, so to speak, and you're you're not ordained to any kind of office, your responsibility is for your family yeah. and your home and to a lesser extent you know your city your county your state your church your church but it's not something that you go out of your way mm -hmm. to start something presumably like, yeah. you have a job that you're supposed to be doing instead <laughs> <For one thing. laughs> you know presumably, honestly yeah. that is something that i think of every day that i spend looking on twitter and seeing people have arguments that you have more things to do than being on Twitter. I, I, a, I, I, I wonder two things. In in full honesty, one, how do you have the time? Most of you are married. That I'm seeing interact on here. You have mm -hmm. wives, you have jobs, you have children, and you're doing some random argument on Facebook or Twitter about uh, lapsarian views. You have better things to do. With time. <laughs> um, and you mean these B, are good Calvinists? <laughs> and two, B, uh, other things that mean the second point. Where do you get the energy? I I, <laughs> I lose energy just I am scrolling. With you on that one. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it's it all comes down to what like, what do you actually have authority over mm -hmm. as far as God is concerned? You don't yeah. you do not have the authority to go out on the streets uh, in a in a cape and cowl, let's say, yeah. uh, and a grappling hook to swing from building to building. You don't mm -hmm. have the authority from God to do that and beat up random people or to kill them and stop them from, from doing things that you don't have any business <laughs> finding them doing. <laughs> I mean, it's one, it's one thing if you are walking in your normal course of duties and you pass an alleyway where someone's getting mugged. Yeah, exactly. That is a different, categorically different issue. <laughs> the Samaritan principle, if in his providence, God brings you into such a situation where turning it away would be consenting with the thief, the murderer, then you intervene, but you don't go down random alleys all night long trying to find <laughs> such things. 
because you get off on it somehow or it makes you feel good about yourself because you're doing something about the problem. Yeah. Self-righteousness. Well, I see we're getting toward the end. So there is one other thing I would like to, to mention. And that has to do with my earlier assertion that this is something that the story is something that many people have never heard. And they did not hear it in Sunday. They probably haven't heard it preached from the pulpit. And they almost certainly didn't hear it in Sunday school. And there, there's a couple reasons. One is it's not a nice story. And so we're dealing with a little Neoplatonism and prudish Neo-Victorianism of, ooh, we can't talk about excrement and bloodshed and all of that because that somehow will defile the minds and hearts of our little children. The little children are going to love the Bible all the more for hearing this. I'm sorry yes. you don't understand children, first of all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Secondly, God put it in the Bible. Who are you to tear it out or to skip over it? I uh, There was um, my our headmaster was looking for a devotional book, or actually a book that he could give to fa uh, fathers, dads in the school, to encourage them to lead their families in devotions. He found one that was pretty good. I read through it. I was like, okay, this is, this is, there's some good points, and it's the rest, there's something offensive until it came to the end. And then there was a list of Bible readings, and there were some that were marked as not age appropriate. In other for words, what age? <laughs> well, it may have been more specific, but the idea is you're, you're talking to your younger kids. Skip this when reading to younger kids is what I would say. Said no, no way. We're 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 back in that. Mm -hmm. The children need to hear the whole Bible. That's what mm -hmm. God told Israel: read the read read the word, read the law. And the law has some messy, disgusting things in it because people are messy and disgusting, and mm -hmm. it addresses it head on. And what are we to do? Wait until TV teaches our children about homosexuality, about abortion. Or are we going to let God teach them first? Mm -hmm. So there's that. The other thing is uh, an entire her hermeneutic and philosophy or theology of Scripture that says that the Old Testament, and sometimes, unfortunately, even the New Testament stories, they're Bible time, Bible land, Bible place, Bible story kind of things, which means they're, they kind of float in this etheric Bible times time, and they, it doesn't matter what order you present them in. They don't expect any relationship because the, the, the point is the point. There's a moral point here. Mm -hmm. These are like inspired Aesop's fables or Ben Franklin Proverbs. As long as the kids get the point, which is often something very simple and moralistic, don't lie, trust God, take down giants. <laughs> which leaves this story out altogether, right? There's not yeah. a, a don't lie or don't do this or don't do that that arises immediately from the story. Yeah. Yeah, what we have here, and I, I've, I've tried to, to say it maybe not so subtly, is we have an anointed savior, a deliverer, who strikes at the head of the enemy forces, brings him down in a disgusting manner to thoroughly humiliate him so that all of his troops are now ready to follow him into battle and take back the promised land. That's a lot more important than a moral takeaway. Yeah, that's the story of Jesus. That's what Jesus did for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a story that's echoed throughout the book of Judges and on into Samuel, and reaches perhaps his high point in the, in the work of David, particularly as he begins with Goliath. Uh, this is a preaching of the gospel. And it falls here because it falls here. This is when it actually historically happened. It happened after Moses, after the 40 years of wandering, after the conquest, after Joshua's dead, after Othniel. And... It's, it's, but it's still toward the beginning of the 300 years of the Judges, so there's still the rest of the book that's falling. And as we get to the end of the Judges, we'll find out, oh, there are two stories at the end that actually do take place earlier to explain why this was going on. The Levites weren't doing their job. They weren't teaching God's word. They weren't being faithful. Mm -hmm. And so that's the background for this. Why, did we, why are the people falling into sin again and again? Why do we need special saviors? Because God's appointed ministers aren't teaching his word and aren't being faithful to their wives and aren't regarding their flocks and aren't guarding worship. I think that's a relevant message for today. Mm -hmm. um, but if you pull it out of that context, you, you miss it all. And you miss one more key step in the coming of Christ. Because what happens if Moab seizes that area of land permanently? That's Jerusalem. That's Bethlehem. That's all that area. What if when it's time for Jesus to come? Moab still holds that because we never got it back. Oops. It, it's part of the story. And it's an important part. And so as we are Bible teachers, Sunday school teachers, parents teaching their kids at home, 
we need to tell the stories in order. And the kids, when they're done, need to be able to tell us the order of the story so that they can see how this is all leading up to Jesus, how at each stage we're picturing and prophesying and preaching Jesus risen, Jesus conquering. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem with how we teach reading as well as the Bible. Um, I was just noticing in one of the reading lessons I was giving to some fifth graders that they were supposed to identify the purpose of a paragraph, a sample mm -hmm. paragraph. And one of the options given, you, well, the options were like to entertain, to persuade, to inform. And then mm -hmm. there was this fourth fourth category of to teach a lesson. Mm -hmm. And of course, guess what kind of paragraph fell into that category was a summary of a Bible story. Uh, of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> And, you know, I don't want to rag on the curriculum because, for one thing, it's very hard to find good Christian curricula. It's very hard. <laughs> very hard. And, I mean, it wasn't that hard to sort of amend and say, we don't really need that category because this is informing us something about something that happened. You know, so it's it's easy to reassign, but, uh, you know, it's something to pay attention to for sure in, as you're educating your children or having them educated. Yes. All right. Well, that is a good place to wrap up and have some recommendations. Can I go first? You can go Please first. Please do. Great, because we talked a little bit about Westerns, and so this is a perfect time to bring up my favorite spoof Western, which is called Hallelujah Trail. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if it's so much a spoof as an affectionate parody. It's just it's just delightful. It's a very long movie. It's like three hours, but it's older. It was made in the 60s, I think. And it's not quite a musical, but you will get the song stuck in your head. And <laughs> it's it's just a, a rollicking good time. You've got these these miners out in Colorado who are running out of whiskey. And of course, this is a problem. Why are miners drinking alcohol without their parents <laughs> present? <laughs> uh, miners, M-I-N-E-R-S. People mining in the mines. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. This is an audio production. <laughs> um, and so you've got, uh, you've got a shipment of whiskey coming from the East Coast to Colorado. However, the U.S. Marshals have heard word that there is a band of Indians coming to intercept the shipment. And we all know how much we don't want the whiskey to fall into the hands of the hostile Indians. Meanwhile, there is also, marching to Denver, a battalion of temperance ladies who do not want the whiskey to arrive in Denver. Oh, wait, I'm remembering this now. Oh, no. <laughs> it's amazing. Hallelujah Trail. Hallelujah Trail. My gosh. Yeah. Um, okay, Brian. I, I will go next because I, I have a movie recommendation as well. And maybe, maybe I forgot what. You said you were going to recommend earlier, but in any case, my recommendation is for the original starring Jimmy Stewart, Rear Window, Oh, oh yes. yes, which I just watched this past week. And Grace uh, Kelly. You and can't Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly. That's true. I can't. And it is it is phenomenally good. Um, yes. I will say I, I watched... That one and another uh, Alfred Hitchcock film this week, which I will uh, recommend next week, so I'm not going to name it. But I found it very funny how he he structures uh, the timing of his movies because they, they they can. I don't want to say they drag because they don't. They're very interesting all the way through, but like um, they'll just be like this slow burn. Right, and it's like it's almost like you're watching a fuse go yeah. <laughs> for a mile, and it's just it's just chugging along, and it's building up, and then eventually, like within the last ten minutes of the movie, it splits into four, <laughs> and you're like, oh, now it's really intense, and then it leads to you know fourteen hundred barrels of dynamite stuck in a hill somewhere, and then everything explodes, and it's done, and that's the movie. It's like his timing is just like, okay, we're up to the moment, we're up to the moment, and it's concluded. Okay, now we're done. Go go home. Yeah. You're fine. You you know how it ends now. Yeah. And <laughs> I found that very interesting. Like there's very little time for Denouement. <laughs> yeah. Even even Rear Window, which gave you more time than the other one that I watched, it was like you get a two minute scene or maybe a one minute scene. It's where about one minute, yeah. 
it's like Grace Kelly is reading goes from well, reading, don't spoil, uh, don't spoil oh, yeah, the yeah. ending at, for this one sort of thing to reading something else. Oh okay. <laughs> well, yes, that. that's probably that makes a lot of sense now that you mention it. Like I've not seen very much Hitchcock. Like I've seen The Birds, I've seen Vertigo, and the one that I enjoyed was Rear Window. Yeah. Um, Rear Window is very good. Yeah, I, I guess technically I've seen North by Northwest, but it's been many years. So mm. yeah. Yeah, I, I'd seen The Birds before. That was the only for years. That was the only Hitchcock film I'd seen. I will tell you someday about my experience with birds, but not right now. With the a, movie, I got, the I birds, got a or with the animal? The, you know, I, I, I have a story that goes with trying to watch the birds with a bunch of college kids. It was oh, no. special. Uh. Anyhow, um, by the way, uh, remind me someday for my recommendation on westerns because I hate westerns. But there's one I absolutely love, but it's not yours. So I'll tell you some other time. I was asking my wife, as you both know, for some kind of recommendation. And she recommended teaching old idioms, figures of speech, expressions that were once common to our parents or grandparents. But today's generation just looks at you and says, what? Or more literally, what does that mean, Mrs. Ettinger? <laughs> it means, oh, I have to explain this. There are books that, and, and no doubt websites, that introduce you to old idioms. And it, being familiar with them will help you communicate with an older generation. It'll also make, help you pay, uh, find your way through a great many older books and things. And unfortunately, do you remember what, what Kate suggested as one? The peanut gallery? Peanut gallery, yes. I'm assuming you both know where that comes from. Am I wrong? I have a guess. <laughs> I've never guess? been told. Oh, okay. So guess? I'm guessing that in theaters, there used to be cheap seats where people would bring peanuts and throw <laughs> the shells at people. Am I very far <laughs> off? That's a great guess. No, that's <laughs> so, not it. Darn it. <laughs> there was an old kids show on early TV, black and white, called Howdy Doody. Oh, I I know that song. It was a puppet show. Yes. It gets stuck in my head. The kids, it was filmed live. And so kids who were invited, were they, they made up the studio audience and they were put off to one side where no doubt the um, staff members and parents could keep an eye on them. That was called <laughs> the peanut gallery because they're little peanuts. Oh. So peanut gallery has come to mean... People, a collection of people who are sitting and watching, but really we don't want involved and have no right really to say anything because <laughs> they're too stupid. <laughs> and so we say things so like no comments. So they're distinct com from hecklers. Distinct. Yeah, no, they're not hecklers. There's like no comments from the PDEC gallery. Mm -hmm. The implication being whoever's making the comment has the maturity of a child and should not be listened <laughs> to, nor should he open his voice right now. Oh, that's so, that so was, much better than my guess. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where that comes from. And no doubt there are many, many others. And maybe we can all think of some cliches, some old-time idioms and cliches that we have struggled with or that we have made a fool of ourselves with. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, oh, wait, we go. Well, <laughs> I have So my Aunt Lou, bless her heart, she came from Cape Girada, Missouri, and... Um, we, we would hang out with her when I was a, a young teenager, um, and she was in her 80s and 90s at the time. And she had all of these amazing idioms. And she was a drama teacher back in, mm. in Southern California when she was – before she retired. But she would always say, like, there's more than one way to skin a cat – or, mm -hmm. no, there's more than one way to kill a cat than kissing it to death. That was the other oh. one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then. <laughs> something would be like taking cold in Newcastle. Or, I don't know, there were a lot of dead cats in her analogies. <laughs> yeah, lots of dead cats. Anyway, yeah. I just okay. had to share those examples. It was, <laughs> Thank you. They couldn't That's be passed That's an up. interesting example. Maybe you can remember <laughs> some more of her charming idioms. All right. Well, there we go. The end. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you helping to keep the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join the numbers of our financial supporters, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion. Uh, we have a Facebook page under the same name. If you want to get in touch with us, you can reach out to halting toward Zion at gmail.com. You can find our podcast pretty much anywhere. If you like to get your podcasts somewhere that we are not, please let us know. 
Uh, we do know we are on YouTube, Rumble, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, etc., etc., etc. Name that Rogers and Hammerstein. But... King and I. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. We will see you next week.